Welcome back. This is part two of my conversation with Frank Juster, where I'll be asking him his thoughts on Bitcoin versus gold. Okay, let's talk gold and Bitcoin now. People are dying to know your yeah, thoughts. Yeah, on the gold, on this, this issue of gold, you know, you've interviewed me a couple of times. You can go back on the Stansbury uh, website to the interview we did a few months ago about, and I talked ad nauseum about my views on gold and the dollar and all that. So I, I don't want to repeat myself. I, I think with respect to gold versus Bitcoin, which seems to be the current debate, <laughs> I just think that um, people should stop arguing about this. Make your choice buy one or the other and shut up. Um, <laughs> I don't yeah. envy you having to referee between Peter Schiff and Max Kaiser. You know, these two are going at each other and it's, it's getting ugly. Um, or buy, just buy both. You know, I have my own opinions about Bitcoin, but that, that, that doesn't make them gospel. Okay, I don't have a crystal ball. I just have opinions that are based on my understanding of what is happening out there, what's driving gold, what's driving Bitcoin. Um, and so I think, yeah, Bitcoin, I think could go a lot, lot higher in the short and near term. Okay. Um, a lot higher. Now, do I believe it as the, some of the debate that's taking place now, which I don't think should be a debate is, will it replace gold? Eh, I don't think so for a lot of reasons. And I think it, if you boil it down to just a simple way to put it, Gold has 3,000 years history as being a, a trusted store of value. It's never, ever, ever failed in 3,000 years. Bitcoin is less than a decade old, and it's just now being viewed by the investing audience as a store of value, okay? Until it reaches near universal adoption, like gold has, gold has universal adoption as a store of value, a store of wealth. Until it reaches that, you're speculating, what you're doing is speculating that it will reach there. And until it does, you are playing the greater fool game. That you're hoping that you buy it, somebody else is gonna pay a higher price, and right now it's in that mania stage of in this debate of being bought up for that reason that you will eventually reach that stage. And it may, but I think it's a long, long way off for a whole host of reasons. But that doesn't mean that it's not gonna go a lot higher, which I personally think it will. I think it's gonna do what some of these people are predicting um, and, get up to a, a much higher price than it is now. But that doesn't make it. So if I had a choice right. of where to store my wealth where I can sleep at night, it's going to be gold. Absolutely, it's going to be gold. If I want to make money because I think something's going higher, I'll buy Bitcoin. But they're two very different things. And I, and I think we're years off from it reaching the stage where it can even make the argument that it's going to compete with gold. Um, and I think there are gonna be roadblocks along the way that it's gonna to have to overcome it. And it may overcome these roadblocks and there are regulatory roadblocks, there are volatility roadblocks, there are, um, it's how new it is, you know, it's its own history. Um, and I think it's the, the cost of using Bitcoin for transactions all of these things are potential roadblocks along the way. And I'm especially concerned about what governments and central banks will do if Bitcoin ever becomes a threat, a real threat to their own sovereign currencies. As you know, a lot of central banks are contemplating issuing their own digital currencies. And they're not going to, and if they're not going to want that competition there, and they're going to make it very difficult governments and central banks will make it very difficult for Bitcoin to become universally adopted. They'll put roadblocks along the way. And I know a lot of people, and I've, I've watched all of the YouTube videos with all of these really smart, smart guys talking about why they can't take down Bitcoin, even if they wanted to. And I've read and listened, and I, you know, I think you know, I, I beg to differ. I think that there are, you, you can never underestimate 
the resolve of governments and central banks when they're trying to protect their currency. You know, you've heard of currency and capital controls. They've been part of our history in many countries, including the US. It came in the form of um, making the ownership of gold illegal in 1933, which lasted 40 years. That was a form of capital control to protect the US dollar. You saw it in pre-1979 Britain, where there were currency controls. You saw it in South Africa. You saw it in pre-war Germany. You saw it as recently as 2015 in Greece. Okay, so currency and capital controls or a method by which to use that philosophy against Bitcoin is a possibility and you have to take that into account. So although I think that Bitcoin is gonna go a lot higher, I don't think it's anywhere near replacing gold. And I don't think we're seeing any evidence that the major owners of gold, the institutions are switching from gold to Bitcoin. You're seeing obviously a few big names like Paul Tudor Jones. I know he's been a big, big advocate of this and, and I'm sure he's gonna make a lot of money out of this, but it's not a, a general view in, in, in the investing public and certainly not with the institutions and certainly not with the central banks. Central banks own gold. They don't own Bitcoin. And they're, you know, gold is a core part of their currency reserves and always will be. And if they do anything, they will issue their own digital currency. They're not going to be buying Bitcoin. Because they're going to try with all their power to undermine Bitcoin. And so that's my view on it. Um, and again, I don't have a crystal ball. I may be completely wrong, but my every fiber in my body <laughs> tells me that if I want to protect my wealth, if that's my primary concern, buy gold. If well, I want to make money and I don't want to speculate, go ahead, buy Bitcoin. And I'm, I'm, I'm trying to bring myself to do it. I haven't done it yet. And, I, and even when it was 19,000 a few weeks ago or so, yeah. I was going, I know it's going hard. I should buy some Bitcoin. I know damn well it's going hard. And I couldn't make myself do it. And even now that's trading around whatever, 33,000, um, I know it's going higher. It might go down a bit more, but it's going to go hard. And I still can't bring myself to do it. But it might change my mind. What, what really, do you think? I can't, I can't. I can't pull the trigger. I can't do it. Wow. Yeah. But you know what? I may change my mind. And you know what? I'm a rational person. I'm not, I mean, I'm not letting my ego get involved in this. You know, yes, I'm a believer in gold. But hey, if I think Bitcoin is going higher and I have true conviction, I'll go ahead and buy some. Maybe you could just buy fractions every week. Maybe that would ease oh. the process. <laughs> Um, Maybe. But your your point about regulatory, I mean, crackdowns, we're already seeing it in the UK, uh, HSBC, uh, you know, saying they're not going to accept uh, payments uh, of Bitcoin uh, or perform transactions with Bitcoin. So really, uh, you know, know your client to the extreme happening in the UK with, with Bitcoin. Just um, a note about, you know, when we say, or I guess Goldbug's biggest beef with Bitcoin is when people say, well, it's a better store of value than gold. You know, the argument there is really like, how can something that volatile that can correct 30% in a day be a, you know, wealth preservation? Well, it can't be until, until, as I said, until it reaches near universal adoption, that will lower the volatility. Right now, there aren't, right. Bitcoin is very tightly held relative to gold. It's a small market cap and it's very tightly held relative to gold. So it can move, it's, it's going to be way more erratic. It's volatility is going to be all over the map. And so that to me is not a store of value. That's you're buying something and you're speculating that something will happen. And two very different things. Frank, let's uh, wrap here with, uh, you're always working on new projects. Uh, you know, just tell us what you're working on, working on now. What can we expect? I'm working on something that is, if it's successful, it'll be the biggest mining deal I've ever done. Uh, and it will change the future of mining. And um, now it's private at this stage, so you can't, sorry, I can't, can't promote you into it at this stage. We're, we're still a private company, but we've already raised over $150 million US um, for this company. We've done a lot of work. And what it is, it, 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 the company's called Deep Green Metals. And it has a, one of the few licensed areas in the clarion Clevertone zone, which is in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. And at the bottom of the ocean, like around 4,000 meters down, are literally 
billions of tons of these nodules, polymetallic nodules that are about the size of large golf balls, unattached to the ocean floor, containing almost pure metal. And it just so happens that the metals in these nodules are the exact same metals that you need for making electric batteries for electric vehicles. Nickel, mostly nickel, uh, copper, cobalt, and manganese. Those are the primary metals in, a, in, in, in the electric vehicle batteries. And as you know, the world is going, moving away from fossil fuels. The world is electrifying. Uh, I think China's kind of leading the way there, but everybody else is catching up. And thanks to Elon Musk, he started a revolution towards electric vehicles. And I, they're going to literally need hundreds and hundreds of millions of tons of nickel and copper and cobalt that's not as readily available on land as it is wow. in these zones beneath the ocean. And um, I mean, if you think about it, just to make one electric vehicle, you right. need 85 kilos of copper, 50, 56 kilos of nickel, seven kilos of cobalt, and about seven kilos of manganese. Okay, and those are the metals in these polymetallic, they're almost pure metal, except for the silica content in there. So the idea and what we spent like literally tens of millions of dollars doing over the last few years is to do all of the resource calculation work because they're lying on the ocean floor. So you have to kind of count how much there is there. And more importantly, do the environmental studies that are gonna be necessary to make this, um, to make the argument that this is far more friendly to the environment than terrestrial mining, which creates toxic waste pits and all sorts of things, you know, de deforestation and everything that's happening in the world today with mining that mining gets criticized for does not exist with these nodules. So the idea is to almost, you know, the, the concept, I'm simplifying it, but you're sucking these things, vacuuming them off the ocean floor with a harvester with minimal disturbance to the environment around it. There's very little life down there. Um, it's mostly very, very small micro, micro life at the ocean floor, but there's still life and you have to be cognizant of them. And we want to do this in a way that will be accepted. So I think, and again, if we succeed, this will be the, by far the biggest deal I've ever done in my life wow. uh, in mining. And, and it will change the future of mining. And I think it's really good for the world. It really, you know, we need to go electric. We need to move away from fossil fuels. Climate change is going to kill us. So um, yeah, that's to me, one of the most exciting things I'm doing. Um, we'll see how it works out, but I'm certainly I keep put, putting more money into it and we'll see what happens. And ESG is just, you know, I think just the main theme of mining going forward here. So uh, just one more point on this, the new company, Frank. So you're in the uh, study phase. You haven't started uh, mm -hmm. not drilling. I don't know what the correct word is. No drilling. No, it's, it's, we've done the resource calculations. So we have almost a billion tons of these nodules down there. We know that. So we're completing all the environmental studies, obviously yeah. doing the feasibility studies for the capital cap cost of the production, which are substantial. Um, you know, this is not a, this is not cheap, uh, this kind of mining, and uh, and obviously bringing in the right strategic partners that will make this a success. We're not right. going to do this on our own. It's far too big a project, but we we're one of the few. I think we're one, if not the only non-government owned license area down there. The rest of the license areas are owned by countries like China, Korea, Japan, and others. Right. Um, we're a private company um, and we have this license area. We've been working on it and we're, one, we're leading the technology, in my opinion, in, in, in figuring out how to, how, to do, how to mine or harvest these nodules successfully without hurting the environment. And I think we'll be in production in the next couple of years. I was gonna ask you how far away are you from, from being in yeah, production? Yeah, I think two, two years, maybe three. That's not, not too far away. So uh, huge strides in mining. Uh, Frank Justra. Oh, and you also have a new olive oil that's spicy. That's, that's something else you're working on. Okay, well, <laughs> I you, saw that and I'm like, wait a second. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. So we, if you have one more minute here. So as you know, I make the best olive oil in the world, Dominica Fury Absolutely. olive oil. It's named after my mother. It is really the best olive oil in the world. Um, so a couple of years ago, we started uh, experimenting, combining the olives and the scotch peppers in the same grinding crushing machine and blending it into a, an oil that was spicy. And we all, we just did it in just small amounts. We took it home, gave it to our friends, our family, and the feedback was 
unbelievable. I love it in soups on anything. And so this year we're actually going to do a very limited edition, a thousand bottles only of the spicy olive oil. A thousand bottles. A thousand bottles. That's it. That's okay, it. Okay, yeah, but on a know. scale of one to you know, um, you know, knock your socks off, spicy. How hot is it? No, no, it's not super hot. Like so I've got hot sauces in my fridge that you know yes. blow the top of your head off. But um, <laughs> but the, the, this is it's a nice medium spice, and again, it's good for I think for soups. It's amazing on meats. Um, just to dip in bread. Fantastic. I'm hungry now. Frank Juice Strap. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you for, for closing out our Outlook 2021. It's always a pleasure Great. speaking with you. Thank you. You're welcome. Likewise. Bye, Daniel. And thank you. Uh, thank you for watching. Uh, this concludes our Outlook series, but we'll still have amazing content coming uh, to you here on Stansberry Research. Uh, so keep following us on all our social media platforms. Thanks for watching. I'm Daniela Kondonia.